Hi there, everyone. Welcome to the Rupa Subramania show. I am Rupa Subramania. Today, we have a very special guest with us. It is none other than renowned psychologist and author, Dr. Matthias Desmond. He is a professor of clinical psychology at Ghent University in Belgium. And it's a real honor for me to be speaking to him today about his groundbreaking book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, which I believe has sparked a paradigm shift in our understanding of the human psyche under totalitarian systems. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Desmet to the show. Welcome to the show, Matthias. It's a real honor to have you here. I've been following your work uh, for a very long time, and it's uh, wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Rupa. I'm glad to be yeah. here. No, uh, it, it's it's my pleasure. So, you know, I'm going to start by asking you, uh, Matthias, uh, you know, your book, uh, which I encourage everybody to get, it's The Psychology of Totalitarianism, uh, is in the context of um, COVID-19 and the public policy responses to it. But you say in your book that you were actually thinking about these ideas well before then. Could you tell us why? Yes. So, so um, it's a dynamic in society that started much earlier than uh, than the corona crisis, of course. And it, it even started, like, well, we could say in the beginning of the 17th century when the modern sciences emerged, um, uh, which in the beginning were um, uh, a kind of truth-telling uh, that um, disrupted the suffocating impact of uh, the religious view on man in the world. Um, and um, at that moment, but uh, which very soon uh, had, a, had, 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 had some unexpected consequences. Uh, the first being maybe that in a strange way, in a hidden way, um, the uh, modern sciences led to the mechanization and the industrialization of the world and to the use of more and more technology. And this had, had a hidden psychological consequence, namely that more and more people started to feel lonely and um, more and more people started to feel, started to be disconnected from their social and natural environments. And that in the end, through a sequence of a cascade of uh, psychological effects, uh, led to the emergence of um, of uh, the, the, the first totalitarian states in history. And that's what my book is all about, about this, this um, the psychological processes that led to the emergence of uh, totalitarian states in the beginning of the 20th century. Before the, to, the, before the 20th century, there were no totalitarian states. There were mm -hmm. classical dictatorships, but there were no totalitarian states. And in the beginning of the 20th century, we had this uh, communist and fascist uh, totalitarianism. Um, but many authors uh, warned us that uh, a new kind of totalitarianism was seizing control of society after, in the second half of the 20th century, and definitely in the beginning of the 21st century, I think, a new kind of totalitarianism, which was a velvet glove totalitarianism. And this way that most people didn't feel that this new totalitarianism emerged. Uh, mm. and, and this new totalitarianism was rather, uh, the ideology was not a communist or a fascist ideology, as I said, but rather a technocratic transhumanist technology, uh, the, an, an, ideology an ideology which believes that the only way uh, to deal with the uh, problems we are facing as a society and as, a, as, as mankind, uh, the only way is to establish uh, a new society uh, which is extremely technologically controlled and which is led by technocrats and uh, academic experts. Um, and um, that's what my book is all about. And, and, and I mm -hmm. think that before the corona crisis, we already noticed uh, this tendency in society, but with the corona crisis, we took a huge leap forward, I think. Uh, in this yeah. direction. So this is a this is a good uh, point to ask you this question. Oftentimes people conflate uh, total totalitarianism, uh, totalitarian systems with dictatorships. Can you tell us what is the difference between uh, what's the difference between the two? 
Yes. The most important difference is situated at the psychological level. So uh, classical dictatorships, to put it in a nutshell, are, are based on a very uh, simple psychological mechanism. So there is mm -hmm. a, small, a small group in, the, in, the, in society, a small group in the population, which is experienced as, or, or which is perceived as being a very, a, a group which disposes of a, of a very uh, impressive, aggressive potential. And because people are scared of this small group of people, they just accept that the small group of people unilaterally imposes its its social contract to the to society, and that's how a classical dictatorships functions at the psychological level. People are mm -hmm. scared of the dictatorial regime, and that's why mm -hmm. they accept that this dictatorial regime imposes its will to the population, to society. Um, in a in a in a, a totalitarian state. Uh, is something completely different. In a totalitarian state, uh, an impressive psychological uh, process happens before the totalitarian state emerges. And that, that process, that psychological process, is a specific type of group formation called mass, or I, 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 I use the term mass formation or crowd formation to indicate that uh, that uh, that that uh, that kind of group formation and it's it's a it's a group formation which has very specific effects at the level of individual mental functioning if a mass emerges in society um, then the people who are in the grip of this mass formation the individuals who are in the grip of it typically lack any capacity to take a critical distance of what the group believes in. That's the first major, major effect at the level of individual psychological functioning. Second, people who are in the grip of mass formation typically um, become willing to sacrifice everything that used to be important for them as individuals before the mass formation started. So they are willing to sacrifice their future, their health, their wealth, uh, no matter what, um, uh, as soon as they were in the grip of this, of this mass formation. And third, when a mass formation emerges, individuals typically, individuals who are in the grip of the mass formation, typically become radically intolerant for dissonant voices. So this process, it, to the extent that in the end, they start to think that it is their ethical duty to eliminate everyone. Who doesn't go along with the masses with the mass formation so that's in a mm -hmm. nutshell what the mass formation is at the phenomenological level it's a kind of group formation in which a, a group of people starts to uh, believe fanatically in a certain ideology or a certain narrative such as um, the race theories of hitler or the uh, historical materialism of, Mar of, of marx and the soviet union um so People start to fanatically believe in a certain narrative. Usually, we are talking about 20 to 30 percent of the population, not much more, which is in the grip of the mass formation. And they believe so fanatically in it that they uh, do not succeed anymore in taking a critical distance of this narrative, yeah. no matter how absurd it is. For instance, in, in Iran, during the, the revolution in Iran, people started to believe that the portrait of their leader, the Ayatollah, was printed on the surface of the moon. And when there was a full moon in the sky, they were typically standing in the streets showing each other where exactly this portrait of the Ayatollah was printed on the surface of the moon. And we, are, we were talking about a highly educated population. And, um, uh, and in the end, they believe so fanatically in, in, in the narrative uh, of their leaders and the ideology of their leaders. Um, that they start to become extremely intolerant towards everyone who doesn't go along with them. And, 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 and this typically leads to a strange state of being where even mothers report their children to the state or the other way around, children report their parents to the state, uh, 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 knowing that they will probably um, uh, be sentenced to death. Uh, mm -hmm. That happened, again, I, I, there is this conversation with, of me with, an, with a woman of Iran on the internet, uh, her name is uh, Sharif Ishtali, uh, where, where, where this 
a, a woman, Iranian woman described to me how she she lived in Iran during the revolution, which was like a huge uh, a mass formation, um, and how she witnessed uh, 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 that the mother who reported her son to the state hung the rope around his neck when 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 he was on the scaffold, and when he when he died, um, when he was hung, uh, she claimed to be a heroine for what she did. So that's a, typically the end stage of a mass formation. People become so convinced of the narrative, of the ideology, that they report everyone who doesn't follow it to the state. And they do so as if it is their ethical duty to do so. So that's, that can seem very strange, but once you understand the psychological mechanism of mass formation, you understand why it has this strange effect at the level of individual mental functioning. And you also understand what you can do against it. You cannot mm. solve the problem immediately, but you know what uh ethical and strategical principles you have to follow if you understand the yeah. mechanism so you've uh, defined what mass formation is it's basically it sounds like it's a form of group think that becomes so incredibly powerful that it uh, makes you believe certain things um even if you are a rational minded individual uh and i think a lot of us went through that during the pandemic um but how does it uh, lead to the emergence of totalitarian systems? In other words, I'm wondering what direction does this go in? Um, you know, you have people who are, um, you know, who bought into a certain narrative, and then you have the political system uh, on the other side. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I'm just wondering, it's, it's you know, in the case of Iran, for example, people were reporting uh, their family members to the state, but you also had a very authoritarian state in place that made people very fearful. Yes, but um, well, you know, uh, totalitarian states can emerge in, in, in slightly different ways, but in the end, the essence yeah. and the backbone of a totalitarian state is always what, uh, what uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, you probably know uh, the, her mm -hmm. German uh, philosopher, yeah. uh, probably the most important philosopher of the 20th century. Hannah Arendt said that, um, the core and the essence of a totalitarian system is always a diabolic pact between the elite and the masses and the crowd. And this diabolic pact can emerge in slightly different ways. For instance, in Nazi Germany, it seems that the masses first got in the grip of, of, of all kinds of race theories. And mm -hmm. once the masses emerged, uh, there soon were a few uh, leaders, talented uh, speakers who used the masses to seize control of the state apparatus. And something similar happened in the Soviet Union, but in a, differently, in a slightly different way. In the Soviet Union, it seems that the mass formation was provoked from the beginning in, in an artificial way through propaganda and indoctrination. So, um, uh, mass formation can emerge more or less spontaneously, but it will soon disappear hmm. if it is not uh, supported and continued through propaganda and indoctrination. So a mass formation might emerge spontaneously, but it will it won't last very long if there is if there is not a, if there are no leaders who 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 time and time uh, recirculate the same narratives through uh, the mass media. Uh, uh, so if, if there are no leaders who use propaganda and indoctrination to, to make sure that the mass formation continues. So, but, but, but sometimes uh, it is provoked from the beginning in an artificial way through propaganda and indoctrination. But no matter what, the end effect is always the same. Uh, there is a, a kind of a pact between uh, uh, an elite and the masses, uh, which uh, together, succeed in seizing control of the state apparatus. And uh, in that way, a, 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 a completely new kind of a state emerges, which doesn't, does not only control a public space and political space, as a classical dictatorship does, but which also controls private space because it has a huge secret police at its disposal, namely all these people who are in the grip of the mass formation and who believe so fanatically in the state narrative that they want to report 
all their family men, members if necessary, if they do not follow the narrative. So that's why a totalitarian state has a much more suffocating impact at the level of the population than a classical dictatorship. And mm, interesting. No. Yeah. I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I, I, th I think we, we, we see something similar now. Uh, a totalitarian state um, emerges in a sneaky way. Very mm. often, very often people don't really notice it. And even the elite itself doesn't only, does not always really uh, 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 be aware of what they are doing. It's, it's, it's always a process in which um, both the elite, let's say the institutions that govern society and the population start to become more and more fanatically convinced that a certain ideology will is necessary and not only necessary, but has the capacity to create a new kind of society, which is always um, portrayed as a, a new paradise for the for mm. for, for mankind, and yeah. uh, and they become so fanatically convinced of it that they believe uh, it is justified to transgress all ethical rules and all. Uh, uh, moral rules in order to realize this new paradise, and that's uh, that's of course where uh, the, the 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 essence of totalitarianism. The essence of totalitarianism is that 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 there is a uh, there are certain leaders supported by a major part of the population who so fanatically believe in their ideology that they think uh, it is justified to. Uh, lie and cheat and 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 uh, kill and murder in the end, uh, in mm. order to impose this ideology and to create this utopian new ideological paradise. Which, according to Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt said, there is only one problem with this totalitarian paradise, and it is that it always looks suspiciously a lot like hell. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's the problem. It kills the essence of the human yeah. being. Yeah. Well, that's that's uh, that's well said, and um, you know, of course, the COVID nineteen uh, crisis uh, and the public response to it, um, the the pandemic is replete with examples of what you describe. Um, what, to your mind, stands out as this one thing that you th can think of from the pandemic that uh, fits this um, fits your uh, fits your thesis? You know, well, it's clear. I think that we are dealing with a with the with the mass formation, uh, mm. like from the beginning, um, it was clear to me and to and to many other uh, academics, I think, that there was something wrong with the narrative. I mean, the statistics. I, from the first week onwards, I started to write uh, opinion papers, trying to show people that the statistics were wrong. Uh, or at least I warned them in some in certain opinion papers. And after a few months, uh, it was proven beyond doubt that the initial statistics had been wrong, because mm -hmm. the initial models, the initial models predicted that that's the best example I can give. I I I I, I always give the same example. The initial models predicted that in a country such as Sweden, uh, sixty to eighty thousand people would die if the country didn't go into lockdown. Would not go into lockdown. Uh, so 60 to 80,000 people would die by the end of May 2020. And by the end of May 2020, Sweden hadn't gone into lockdown and only 6,000 people died. And um, um, so, and even then, uh, the narrative just continued. And there were so many other examples, so many other examples that, that all showed uh, that, 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 that the narrative was absurd and had been completely wrong. And still the narrative continued and, and people continued to buy into the narrative and even accepted that um, they lost their, uh, their freedom. They were locked away in their houses, that they, they, they had to wear masks, that they, 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 they lost many of their most elementary uh, civil rights. Uh, and, and, and they still, they, people accepted it, uh, even in an enthusiastic way. And uh, also like, like People accepted that um, dis dissonant voices were censored on a on a scale that was that had never been seen before. Uh, uh, 
so there were all kinds of signs that showed that a mass formation was going on. And, um, and um, 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 I think that, that, that this in itself, like, but we also have to give another example, like suddenly we all accepted that the democratically elected politicians actually um, didn't take the decisions, and decisions anymore in society. It were the experts, technocratic experts, technical experts yeah. who took decisions. Uh, and the, I, I, I think that, that, that numerous things showed us that we actually, at least temporarily, replaced democracy with a technocratic system. And mm. um, 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 so, um, and even after the well, you know, I don't, I don't actually don't believe that at this moment uh, the Corona measures uh, are, are really over. <laughs> we still see uh, how vaccination campaigns are prepared. Um, we see, we see how um, uh, parliaments. Um, prepare to um, make many of the corona measures, I think, actually permanent. Yeah, well, here in Canada, the vaccine mandates um, were last year suspended, not completely dropped, and we're never going to... Yeah, so it's, you know, they could always uh, bring them back if uh, if necessary. And uh, yes, you're right that the vaccine campaigns are still ongoing. Um, uh, Canada seems to be a special case of uh, paranoia and mass formation because um, we're still tracking things like wastewater signal uh, signals, uh, you know, the what's the level of uh, COVID-19 in our wastewater, for example, and, uh, um, and you know, many of these experts just re simply refuse to move on. And, uh, and as a result, I think the public is still in, 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 in the grip of this fear. Um, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's actually quite disturbing to see young people, um, you know, so afraid uh, to step out of their homes without wearing a mask, and uh, and that's quite uh, fascinating to see. Well, one of the one of the elements in your book, Matthias, um, you know, you talk about the presence of a charismatic leader in totalitarian movements, and um, you know, what are the psychological factors that uh, that make uh, individuals and you know uh, susceptible to charismatic leaders and and how do these leaders uh exploit these vulnerabilities uh yes yes uh well um in order for a, a large scale mass formation to emerge you need indeed you need very specific psychological conditions in a population um and it is exactly these conditions that were more, were more and more met throughout the last few centuries and which made the population more and more vulnerable for mass formation, which made that the mass formations became bigger and lasted longer and which in the end, in the beginning of the 20th century, made that the masses became so strong that they could seize control of the state apparatus. So that's, that's uh, so, and, and all, everything starts, I think, with, with these psychological conditions of the population. So uh, the first condition is that in order for a mass formation to emerge, a large-scale mass formation, many people have to feel lonely and disconnected. So that's the most crucial condition. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's what it's what um, the Frankfurt School and Hannah Arendt and even earlier Hegel called the atomization of society. Atomization yeah. of society me meaning that people start to feel disconnected from each other and from nature. So that that that's that's actually in itself. That's a consequence, I think, of the industrialization and the mechanization of the world. I, I, I won't go into this now, but you can see how almost the invention of every mechanical device to a certain extent disconnects people a little bit of their environment and the use of technology as well. We all, we all think that uh, communication technology connects people to each other, and that's true, but only at the level of the exchange of information. Um, uh, at a certain level, they also disconnect people because if you talk with someone in a technological, in a digitalized way, then uh, maybe 
you will be able to exchange information in a very efficient way. But at the level of uh, the physical experience of the conversation, it will not be comparable to a real conversation. And in a real conversation, the, the, the bodies of people constantly resonate with each other. And that's why we uh, have a very efficient, empathic uh, 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 feeling when we meet someone in person, uh, while we have it less when we meet someone uh, in the digital world. So I, I could I describe certain examples in my in my in the first chapters of my book. But anyway, it's it's, it's this is the industrialization, the and the mechanization of the world, and the use of technology, with which uh, uh, increased loneliness and disconnectedness throughout the last few centuries. And just before the Corona crisis. Uh, the number of uh, lonely people really peaked. Hmm? Like, like in Northern America, uh, um, the U.S. Surgeon General uh, warned that there was a epi an epidemic of loneliness. And and in in the U.K., Theresa May appointed the Minister of Loneliness because she recognized how many people felt lonely. Up to mm -hmm. somewhere in between forty and sixty percent of the people of the population worldwide, uh, um, re in, in certain surveys, reported. Um, that they that they that they uh, felt lonely to the extent that they didn't have one meaningful um, uh, real contact, a real um, uh, uh, social bond with someone. So that that shows us the proportions of the problem. It was huge. And then once people feel lonely and disconnected, they are easily confronted with uh, lack of meaning making in life. So uh, that's 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 a psychological consequence. Uh, people feel in a spontaneous way that their life is meaningful every time they see that they have that they have an effect on someone else and if you feel lonely you don't see that anymore you don't experience anymore that your life that you that that you as a, as a human being has an effect on another human being so that's the reason why this loneliness usually leads to lack of uh, uh, purpose lack of meaning making in life and then in a next step and that's crucial in a next step once people feel lonely um and um once they are confronted with lack of meaning making, they will typically be, be confronted with something very specific at the level of their affective emotional life. They will be confronted with so-called free-floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression. That means a kind of anxiety, frustration, and aggression that people cannot con connect to a mental representation, meaning a kind of anxiety, frustration, and aggression uh, in which people don't know what they feel anxious, frustrated, and aggressive for. And yeah. when they are in that condition, people typically are extremely vulnerable for propaganda. And that's important. Because if under these conditions, a narrative is distributed through the mass media that indicates an object of anxiety and a strategy to deal with that object of anxiety, something very specific might happen. All this free-floating anxiety might suddenly connect to the object of anxiety, for instance, the virus or the Jews or the aristocracy in the, the Soviet Union, doesn't no matter what, or the witches during the witch hunts. All this free-floating anxiety might connect to the object of anxiety. And people might be willing on a large scale to participate in the strategy to deal with that object of anxiety, even if that strategy is utterly absurd. Why? Just because in that way, they feel they can control their anxiety. If you're anxious, but you don't know what you're anxious for, then you feel completely out of control. And that's an extremely aversive mental state. And as soon as you can connect your anxiety to something, you can, and someone provides you with a strategy to deal with that something, with that object of anxiety, then you might be willing to participate in that strategy because it makes you, it gives you the feeling that you're in control of your anxiety. And it's exactly the same, in exactly the same way, individual psychological functions, em, uh, symptoms emerge. Usually, for instance, a, a, a classical a phobia emerges in exactly the same way. Someone is confronted with, uh, free-floating anxiety, which he cannot connect to something. And suddenly, for us, in, a, in a strange way, the person, the person is scared of spiders. Just because, mm. uh, without being aware of what happened, he connected his anxiety to a certain object. Because in that way, 
he can control his anxiety, be it only by avoiding that phobic object. So, and, and then that, that can also happen at the level of a society where, where people, 20 to 30 percent of the population, connects its anxiety all to the same object, an object that is provided in a narrative that is disseminated through the mass media. And so, and that's the first, so the first psychological advant advantage, symptomatic advantage, is that people can control their anxiety. Second, they can uh, take their frustration and aggression out on something. They know now what the cause of the problem is, or they believe they know, mm. and they, they have a, an excuse now to uh, take their anger, their frustration, their aggression out on someone or something. That's a, that's a second psychological advantage. And then the third and the most important psychological advantage of the mass formation is that uh, because so many people at the same time participate in the strategy to deal with the object of anxiety, they feel connected again. They don't feel lonely anymore. So they feel mm -hmm. as if they fight a collective heroic battle with the object of anxiety. And this is if they got rid of their loneliness. I said as if, because they are not really. Um, yeah. because, because a mass is a, is a group that emerges. Not because individuals connect to other individuals. No. The mass is a group that emerges because each individual separately connects to a collective ideal, connects to a collective. So the famous mm -hmm. solidarity of the masses is never a solidarity of individuals with other individuals. It's a solidarity of an individual with a collective, meaning that the longer the mass formation exists, the less solidarity people feel for each other and the more they feel for the collective. And in the end, the solidarity and the love for the collective becomes much stronger than the solidarity with other individuals. And that's why, in the end, even the strongest bonds between people, such as the bond between the mother and a child, becomes weaker than the bond of the mother with the collective. And that's why, in the end, mothers report their children to the state if they are not loyal enough to the state narrative. So that's what happens in a, in a, in a mass formation. And that's why it has these strange effects at the level of individual mental functioning. Um, hmm. and, yeah. I, I'm uh, very interested in this link you make between, um, you know, the psychological di uh, dynamics of totalitarianism and uh, populism. Um, you know, what are the psychological factors, um, you know, um, that uh, that are part of totalitarian totalitarianism uh, that that could uh, bring about populist movements, for example? Um. Well, you know, it depends, of course, how you define populism. But mm. if you define if you define populism as the manipulation of the masses through speech, um, through um, well, through 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 propaganda, then 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 um, populism, or at least then every kind of totalitarianism is populism, but not the other way around, I think. Not the other okay. way around. Not, not all populism is totalitarianism because there are there are other characteristics of, top, uh, of totalitarianism which are necessary to, to, uh, to, to consider something as totalitarianism. For instance, there must be a strong ideological motivation. Totalitarian systems uh, always have this strong ideological drive. They try to create a new society, a new society which is always... Um, um, conceived as a, as a kind of a paradise which will free the human being of all its suffering and all its, um, all its uh, limitations, all the limitations of the human condition. And now, nowadays, so that was the case in the Soviet Union, it was the case in Nazi Germany, and nowadays I think um, what some people, what, what drives this system is the transhumanist ideology, I think. It's the idea that um, the human being can, um, that we need to create a digital environment, a digital society, a technological society, uh, 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 in which if you read the, the works of, for instance, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, the human being uh, mm -hmm. will live forever 
in a in a in a biochemically induced state of eternal happiness. That's about what uh, the the transhumanist ideology believes, and uh, I think um, what certain people uh, believe has to be imposed to society, no matter at what price. Um, yeah. You've talked about uh, the sense of powerlessness and loss of um, autonomy. These are fundamental uh, uh, elements in totalitarian systems. Um, and, you know, how this loss of individual agency uh, contributes to the, um, to, to, you know, how people are uh, psychologically manipulated in, within such systems. Uh, and you also mentioned fear. Uh, fear was definitely a very important component and central component of the pandemic. And, um, you know, how, how is fear used as a tool of control? And where you find individuals like the people that I mentioned earlier who are still masked and getting their sixth or seventh boosters, booster shots, uh, you know, how do you, exp you know, they're, they're now stuck in a chronic state of fear? Yes, Fear is often used yeah. by people who who want to manipulate the population. Uh, I think people have always, people of all times have been confronted with anxiety. In medieval Europe, people were anxious as well, maybe even more than now. But the most important thing is that um, is this free floating uh, quality of the anxiety. If people are anxious and they don't know what they feel anxious for, and you can very easily uh, uh, um, connect their anxiety to an object of anxiety and make them follow your strategy to, to fight that object of anxiety. So, uh, and that's what I think, that's, that's the characteristic state of the 20th century population is that they are very often confronted with, with, a, with a kind of unease, a kind of psychological suffering, a kind of, um aversive effects uh, without really knowing what uh, uh, they are scared of what they are anxious uh, for and that's the ideal state in which people are very easily um get very easily in the grip of propaganda so uh, um you know about some something also very something that is also very important is uh before the french revolution there was no such thing as modern propaganda. The church sometimes used propaganda, but that was of a completely different nature than the kind of propaganda we use now, that are, that are used now. And uh, after the French Revolution, uh, the, the, the elite, the new elite, um, which had to be democratically elected, started to realize that they could no longer impose their will to the population as the... Um, as, a, as, a, as the elite before the French Revolution did. So they had to find a solution for that. And they actually found one. Mm -hmm. They decided that if they could no longer overtly impose their will to the population, they would make the population do what they wanted without them realizing that they do what they wanted. And that was the moment when the modern institutes, institutes of propaganda were born. The, the first institute of propaganda was established by Napoleon immediately after the French Revolution or shortly after the French Revolution. And it was called... Uh, Le Bureau d'Opinion Public, uh, um, the Office for uh, Public Opinion. And mm -hmm. after the French Revolution, um, so the, the propaganda became more and more and more important to the elite. It became their privileged way to have a grip on the population. Um, and, uh, and that, at the same time, in a strange way, at the same time, the population more and more got in the state where they became sensitive for propaganda. So on the one hand, you had the development of an elite mm. which uh, used more and more propaganda. And on the other hand, you had a population which became more and more vulnerable for propaganda. And, and, and that together led to the emergence of the so-called lonely masses. And you, you know, mass formation has always existed, but the uh, ancient masses were physical masses. Um, the individuals that constituted the mass met physically. Otherwise, there could be no mass formation. But now we can, uh, now the mass is often uh, uh, consists of individuals who all live isolated in their houses, but who are all infused by the same narratives, the same mental representations through the mass media. And in this way, uh, they are mentally 
a mass or a crowd, but they never physically meet or usually do not physically meet. And this lonely mass is a mass that uh, can continue to exist for a very long time and that can be governed and steered and manipulated in a much more efficient way than the physical mass. So, um, uh, oh, well, that, that's the state, that's what the, the, the situation where we find ourselves in now, I think. Uh, there is a, uh, there are a, a set of global institutions who think it's their ethical duty to use nudging and all kinds of uh, manipulation techniques, psychological manipulation techniques, to make the people accept that society is reshaping from a democracy into a technocracy. Mm. Um, and they use all kinds, you know, the leaders of the masses usually fanatically believe their ideology. So that means that uh, Gustave Le Bon said the leaders of the mass usually are hypnotized as well, because mass formation is a kind of mass hypnosis. It's, it's exactly the same. It's identical to a hypnotic uh, process. Uh, but the leaders of the mass usually are also hypnotized by their own ideology. But, and that's something important, the fact that they are hypnotized by their own ideology, the fact that they fanatically believe their own ideology, does not mean that they believe the narratives they use because mm. they, the narratives very often are a kind of propaganda which they use to convince the population to accept all these ideological reorientations, this reshaping of society according to their ideology. Um, so um, that's the difference. The, the, the leaders of the masses usually uh, fanatically believe in, in their own ideology, but they do not believe the, the narratives they use to, to impose this ideology to society. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Matthias, I have so many questions to ask you, but I know uh, you, 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 you know, have to go. And uh, uh, but one final question for you, um, you know, based, uh, you know, on your analysis, uh, you know, what are some, you've identified the problem, you've identified the psychological mechanisms behind what is going on and what we went through during the pandemic. What are some uh, things that people can do that individuals and societies can do to prevent uh, this sort of thing from happening? Yes, well, the, the first and, and, and foremost uh, uh, principle is that uh, people have to continue to speak out in a, in a quiet and respectful way. The people who do not believe in the, in the narratives or the ideology uh, that seizes control now of society um, have to continue to speak out. That's something that is mentioned already in the 19th century by such people as Gustave Le Bon, who wrote this wonderful book, uh, uh, The Psychology of the Crowd. Um, he said that if there is a, a mass formation in a society or in a, in, in a group of people, then there will always be certain people who do not fall prey to it for one reason or another. Uh, certain people just do not fall prey to a mass formation. And um, these people typically will, will, will have the feeling, will, will want to warn uh, the people in the mass formation that what they believe in is absurd and often dangerous for themselves. Mm. And Gustave Le Bon said like, well, these people who do not fall prey to the mass formation typically will try to wake the people up who are in the mass formation, but they won't succeed. So they will never be capable of convincing the people who are in the mass formation that what they believe in is absurd. But Gustave Le Bon said, that does not mean that their, that their words or their speech has no effect. Not at all, he said. If the people who are not in the grip of the mass formation continue to speak out in a quiet way, then they will prevent the masses to go to the last stage of the mass formation. The last stage where the masses become convinced that they have to eliminate everyone who doesn't go along with them. And so the dissonant voices constantly disturb the mass formation a little bit. And uh, in that way, they make sure that the mass formation doesn't go to the ultimate stage, the most destructive stage. 
That's one thing. And of course, mm -hmm. even much more important is that the people who do not fall prey to the first mass formation, to the major mass formation, must be very careful that they, that they do not fall prey to an alternative mass formation because also exactly. that happens. Also that happens. Yeah. People yeah. Who, who do not go along with the, with the mainstream narrative also are in a situation where they feel threatened, anxious, where they feel a lot of frustration and aggression. And they might also mm -hmm. try to find a narrative which yeah. in, a, in a very simplistic and reductionist way attributes all the anxiety to one object, for instance, an evil elite, uh, uh, which would be the cause of all the problems. Yeah. And which, uh, if it would be destroyed, uh, uh, the problem would be solved. No, that's never true. The, 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 the problem, the, the, the root cause of the problems is not the elite. It's the ideology. It's our rationalist view on man and the world, our materialist view on man and the world, which led to the emergence of a new elite and which brought the population in a state where they are vulnerable for uh, the techniques of this new elite, namely the propaganda. So you have the combination of the two. As long as we continue uh, to think about uh, life uh, in, in our materialist, rationalist way, we will always be confronted with mass formation. And the danger of totalitarianism will always be there. So, uh, and, and we will always feel lonely and fall prey to mass formation and so on and so on. So what we need is we need to reconsider our most elementary, basic view on men in the world. Uh, uh, and, and that will bring the population, if we succeed in doing so, that will connect, reconnect people with each other, will make them less vulnerable to uh, um, propaganda and indoctrination, and it will make that a new elite emerges, which probably will use truth-telling rather than propaganda as a way to um, um, govern society. Um, well, um Thank you, Matthias. That was uh, a fascinating conversation. I could have gone uh, on and on and on, but uh, I know we have very limited time. Uh, but it was a real uh, honor and privilege to uh, be able to be in conversation with you. Uh, and thank you for um, uh, you know helping me understand, and hopefully our viewers and listeners understand you. Um, the human psyche uh, behind uh, all of this and, uh, uh, you know, and helping us explore, uh, you know, all of the mechanisms that underlie the rise of totalitarian systems. And I really, really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your insights. And I really urge everybody to pick up a copy of your book, uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And uh, I really hope to have you back on the show sometime soon, perhaps to continue the conversation. Yes, yes, Rupa. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, please tell me if you uh, want uh, to continue our conversation on another. I way. would love. I would love to. I would love to. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank Rupa. You. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.